Hi, uh, my name is Tsukuru Force, and uh, uh, I'm so honored and excited to present here at the BFP National uh, Annual Convention with my um, friend, uh, Michael Lindley. So uh, the two faces nuclear, the title, you know, from Fukushima to, uh, from Hiroshima, Nagasaki to Fukushima, um, is, it comes from like my uh, very personal experience and uh, my, my journey uh, as an activist. So a um, little bit about my background. I was born in Sasebo, Nagasaki, which I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with because we have a US military base in Sasebo. And uh, so I spent my uh, 12, first 12 years of my life in Sasebo, Nagasaki. And I ended up in a school in Hiroshima where 350 students uh, died on August 6th, or well, because of the A-bomb, you know, they may, they may have lived like after that, but um, as a result of the bomb, uh, they died, 350 young lives were lost. So, um, so, you know, having that kind of like personal, uh, intimate experience and relationship with the victims of A-bomb, uh, many of my, many of teachers uh, at my school were survivors. And also like, you know, um, when you go to a school like that in Hiroshima, uh, almost everyone that you know, like everyone that you, you know, your classmates uh, has someone in their life uh, who either died because of the bomb or who were affected, uh, you know, by the bomb. So, you know, I, I always considered myself, you know, uh, being aware of the issue, you know, being aware of the danger of nuclear. And uh, I spent my adult life, you know, kind of going about my own business. And um, um, so when Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster happened in 2011, it was personally shocking and devastating to me because, as I said, I consider myself as highly aware individual, but I was completely blindsided by this because I wasn't aware of this part, this side of nuclear. So, um, you know, even though I went to the school in Hiroshima, uh, who, you know, uh, is very much uh, involved in, uh, uh, in peace education, you know, what I realized after Fukushima is that, uh, you know, I almost never, we almost never heard about nuclear power, nuclear energy, because it was always, you know, ever since the war, it was always advocated in Japan as a peacetime use of nuclear. So there was like a bad side and good side of nuclear, you know, bad side being a nuclear weapons. So we say like, okay, so we should never have that, use that, you know, um, like that. And, and good side of nuclear, which is nuclear power, nuclear power plants, nuclear energy. Yeah, so that's the way to the future. You know, we have to utilize that. So that was like, what we were taught. And after Fukushima, I realized that, uh, you know, what a lie that was, you know, and I was devastated, I was angry. Um, I was angry, uh, most of all, at myself, actually, because, um, you know, I, I just couldn't understand, like, why I didn't see that, why I didn't, I didn't see you know, these were uh, two sides of the same coin, nuclear weapons and nuclear power, you know, nuclear energy. So that inspired this presentation, uh, the two faces of nuclear. And uh, uh, that brings me the purpose of today. Uh, so the purpose of today, I'm just gonna tell you upfront so that we have the same understanding. Um, so, you know, ever since Fukushima, I started to realize and I started to kind of obsess actually <laughs> about the need for education uh, in, in the danger of nuclear. And uh, 
the education is uh, almost non-existent. Unfortunately, both in Japan and the United States, this may surprise you, uh, surprise you all, but in Japan, unless you go to school, like my, you know, like my school in Hiroshima or Nagasaki, uh, you really do not learn much about uh, what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, because it's just like part of like, it's a small part of modern history, which uh, we just kind of like quickly go over because uh, Japanese education is so focused on, uh, you know, the uh, uh, university entrance exam or, um, yeah. So uh, modern history is like kind of like quickly skipped over because it's like the last part that we study, right? So as a result, uh, we don't really learn much about uh, A-bomb experience. But I think, you know, it's, uh, there's a great need, you know, obviously, I think I'm speaking to the choir, but uh, obviously, there's a great need uh, to teach young people and also about like grown-ups about what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But not only that, you know, as as people talking about uh, in the in yesterday's session, there's a great need to talk about all people who were uh, victims and survivors of all nuclear atrocities. So not only Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Fukushima. So, um, so today's, you know, the purpose of the presentation today is uh, to inspire you, uh, if it's possible, inspire you, inspire all of us together uh, to do sort of community-based education in your own communities, in your own local areas. And uh, uh, I will use resources that are available to you for free, mostly, uh, actually for all of, all of, all of our free. So uh, whatever I present today, actually you can do this also uh, with free resources that you can reach out to. So um, this presentation I think is uh, pretty unique. Um, in like all of the programs that we have at the convention this year, uh, because it's it's very like highly highly personal and highly emotional, um, and uh, it's a multimedia presentation, so we can have a lot of fun. I think. So um, I'm going to present a story or stories about the Hibakusha experience in Hiroshima using collection of Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum. Um, so uh, as this page says, this presentation was made possible, is possible by the courtesy of Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum. And anything you see in this presentation is available to you for free with some paperwork and guidelines to follow, uh, you know, such as like you have to specify like where you use this and uh, when you're gonna use this and uh, you know you have to kind of sign the paperwork and stuff like that but uh, on their website there's a section called peace database and uh, you can find a bunch of like photos and uh, drawings by Hibakusha that we're gonna see today uh, and uh, video testimonies and uh, so uh, what you can do is like you know go to their peace database and uh, find what you like, you know, what you may want to use in your own event or education programs. And you just have to contact the uh, curatorial department at um, Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum. So, so, uh, so I'm going to start my storytelling. So, um, when we hear Hiroshima, uh, unfortunately, I think the uh, image that we have is a devastated city by uh, the A-bomb. But in fact, when the A-bomb hit, Hiroshima was a modern city with vibrant life. And people loved the city of Hiroshima and the people so proud of their hometown. So let us travel back in time uh, and I'm going to bring in this short video to show you in 1935 how the city of Hiroshima looked like. 
Okay, so as I said, this was taken in 1935, 10 years before the bomb uh, dropped over the sky of Hiroshima. And uh, as you can see, it was a very vibrant uh, town, uh, manufacturing center of the uh, Chugoku region of Japan. And you can see such a mix mixture of people, you know, with the uh, modern Western style clothing and also like traditional uh, kimono type clothing as well. And um, when I see this video, I don't know, it just, it just kind of breaks my heart. Uh, it's, it's because uh, young girls walking around. Okay, I'm gonna stop talking. I'm just gonna uh, end the video and talk again. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So um, what I was saying was, uh, as you can see, um, so many like girls, you know, very like in you know, a fashionable uh, garbs walking around makes me think of, uh, you know, students at my school. And when I was studying there, I often think, you know, about like uh, what it must have been like. Uh, because these were ordinary girls. They just lived way back when in, you know, 1945. But if you can think of like teenage girls nowadays, uh, you know, if you know someone in your life, if you, if you have daughters who are teenagers, uh, these girls were not much different. Uh, of course, that was a wartime. So, you know, things were short, you know, like they didn't have a lot of things. But, you know, because like they wanted to uh, be fashionable, they did things like, you know, with the uh, uh, inside of their kimono, uh, they may get like a little remnant of fabric, which is like, you know, uh, colorful, uh, with the colorful patterns and stuff like that. And they, they sewed it on onto their kimono so that they can just kind of uh, experience a little bit of their individuality in wartime. So they were like ordinary girls, you know, who liked chatting with friends and stuff like that, hanging out and, and, you know, this happened. So I wanted to show you the contrast of the vibrant city and uh, this devastation uh, that happened after the bomb. And this was photographed by the US Army. Uh, most photos that we see nowadays, uh, you know, were taken by the US Army because um, as you can imagine, like there was no one who can take pictures, you know, uh, no Japanese can take pictures these days uh, in the devastated city. So now I'm gonna take you through the stories of Hipakusha. Um, so many people talk about uh, Pika Don. Pika means flash and Don is the blast. So, but some people talk about, um, you know, they didn't actually hear the dong, uh, the blast. They just saw the flash of light, which was so bright that they were engulfed in this uh, flash. So this person, Shiro Tsukihara, uh, was age 16 at the time of the bombing. And uh, he painted this picture when he was age 73. And uh, uh, so when you go to Hiroshima Peace Memorial website, uh, Hiroshima Memorial Museum website, great thing about uh, the website and its resources is that, so you can uh, not only borrow these uh, pictures, uh, there's like, you know, there are descriptions that come with it. Uh, so it specifies the uh, victim's age uh, when, you know, uh, when they were exposed. To, to the bomb and where they were uh, from the hypocenter. So this person was, uh, you know, 2.4 miles from hypocenter. So uh, after the bomb, after the initial flash and blast, uh, many people lost consciousness. And when they came to, what they saw 
was a living hell. So this person, Masako Yoshiyama, she was age 13 at the time of the bombing, one mile from Hypocenter, uh, just about where my school was and is. So he saw, I mean, she saw uh, the flames, you know, fires everywhere. And uh, somebody in a uh, fire screaming, it hurts, help. So that's the, that was the common sight that people, see, people saw. Another site that was mentioned, that's mentioned often by the survivors, were the river and a uh, uh, river full of bodies, uh, people trying to escape from the heat and fire, and also uh, people wanting to drink from the river. So uh, Yoshio Take Takaha Takahara was age 34 at the time of the bombing, 0 0.4 miles from hypercenter. So streets filled with roof tiles and pieces of wood were impassable, so everyone headed to the river. Some died and were swept away. So at the beginning of the presentation, you saw the video uh, footage, and uh, there was a river, and the river Otagawa uh, especially, I mean, there are several rivers in the city of Hiroshima, but Otagawa is a um, kind of center uh, of Hiroshima people, you know, people in Hiroshima uh, and their life. So they uh, try to escape from the heat and also, but they try to, you know, as, as um, Yoshio says, they were trying to, uh, you know, pass to the other side. So they, you know, get it, got into the river, but uh, many of them did not make it to the other side. Another thing that people saw, uh, you know, people who are like living beings, but uh, look like ghosts. Um, Kichisuke Yoshimura, age 18 at the time of the bombing, 2.6 miles from the hypocenter. Their clothes ripped to shreds, their skin hanging down. On the riverbank, I saw figures that seemed to be from another world. Ghost-like, their hair falling over their faces, their clothes ripped to shreds, their skin hanging. A cluster of these injured persons was moving wordlessly towards the outskirts. Another theme that we have from the Hibakusha, uh, uh, Hibakusha stories, black rain. So the black rain started to fall uh, about 30 to 40 minutes after the bomb. And uh, people who were really, uh, you know, hot and thirsty from the uh, fire and heat uh, started to drink the rain. And uh, of course, the rain was radioactive. So a lot of people had uh, internal um, exposure, uh, internal damage because of that. And uh, the common sight was, um, so I'm gonna show you like next several pictures, maybe like three, four drawings uh, has a common theme of uh, people not being able to help someone. Uh, because they were trying to run for their lives as well. So this drawing is titled, Mom. So Fujioka Hisayuki, uh, 12 at the age of the bombing, uh, he was at the 0 0.6, 0 0.9 miles from the hype center. Hurry, hurry, desperate to get away from the approaching fire, a mother holding her child by the hand was running, running, but not very successfully, because of her long kimono. The mother let go of her child, shouting, run quickly and I'll catch up with you. At that very moment, a tornado-like swirl of fire engulfed and swallowed the mother. The child collapsed into tears, screaming, mom, mom. So another picture, uh, Shisako Sasaki, age 19, at the time of the bombing, 0 0.9 miles from Hype Center. I heard a very young girl shouting for help from a burning upstairs window. The memory still haunts me. Yoshinori Kato, 17 at the end of the bombing, uh, 1.2 miles from the hypocenter. The elementary school had collapsed completely. 
and became engulfed in flames while its pupils remained trapped underneath. Help! I could hear the shouts squeezed out with all their remaining strength, but had no choice but to run from the falling sparks of fire. So um, I just have to point out, I want to point out that one of the things that survivors um, suffered from, uh, you know, one of the things that tormented them was uh, being unable to help someone. And it's a common story uh, from the Hibakusha experience. Um, and, uh, you know, that sight of uh, someone engulfed in flames or uh, being underneath of the uh, building uh, still haunt uh, many of them. So this is uh, Tomomi Yamasha, age 16, at the time of the bombing, 2.2 miles from uh, hypocenter. So the whole body was so deeply charred that the gender was unrecognizable, yet the person was weakly writhing. I had to avert my eyes from the unbearable sight, but it entrenched itself in my memory for the rest of my life. And the night came on August 6th. Uh, many people mentioned the, uh, the whole city of Hiroshima was in flame. Um, and uh, so this person was age eight at the time of the bombing, 1.6 miles from the hypocenter. And actually, I, I guess the, this drawing was uh, the dawn, the, uh, the site of the you know, dawn and uh, how the city looked and the memory of that. Next morning, August 7th, a mother was calling her child from the bridge. The river underneath was full of dead children. Sueko Sumitomo, uh, Sumimoto was aged 37 at the time of the bombing, 0.4 miles from the hypocenter. Most of the area's victims were mobilized students of similar stature and all aged around 13 or 14. The dead children filled the river and the riverbank, some drifting downstream, bobbing up and down like floating white radishes. On each of the stone steps leading to the river were bodies of children who looked as if they had cascaded on top of each other. It was heartbreaking to see their young, innocent faces. There was also a mother calling her child. And uh, so next, including the previous one, next three, four pictures, a common theme is mother and child. So this picture was drawn by Kazuo Matsumo, Matsu, uh, Matsumuro. Uh, he drew this at age 61, but he was age 32 at the time of the bombing, 0 0.5 miles from hypocenter. Where shall I burn the body of my dead child? White maggots crawled in the face, burns of the child she carried on her back. She probably picked up the metal helmet as a receptacle for her child's bones. She had to walk quite a distance to find the combustible material for the fire. Mitsuko Taguchi was age 30 at the time of the bombing, 0.6 mile from the hypocenter. Carrying her child, she had probably been unable to outrun the flames. Her hair was standing on end. She still protected her child under her breast like a living person. Her eyes were open wide. I cannot forget that shocking sight. Shinsaku Koguchi was age 25 at the time of the bombing, 0 0.3 mile from hypocenter. Seeing the dead child made me see how the mother died. I could imagine the cries of pain, how they must have loathed to die. The story of death narrated by the pair froze my faculty to think. Stupefied, I stared at the bodies. I apologized about human sinfulness to no one in particular. I simply could not leave without burning myself with a portion of this agony. 
So another thing that's very common among Hibakusha, uh, the victims and survivors of the A-bomb experience, is the, uh, their guilt and the enormous, this enormous sense of loss of humanity that they experienced on that day. Um, so they witnessed something that's just unthinkable for humans to do uh, on another human beings. And also, you know, again, uh, being powerless in the uh, situation really, you know, um, gravely pained them. Uh, yeah, um, so that's the common experience. So next three, four pictures, the theme is people looking for loved ones. So Fumie Ishikawa was age 16 at the time of the bombing, 1.9 miles from hypocenter. I went around looking closely at anyone who had a build, build similar to my younger brother. I found one of his friends, Van, passed away at the entrance, but my younger brother wasn't there. Hisako Murata was age 29 at the time of the bombing, 3.1 mile from hypocenter. Dead children were laid in rows underneath straw mats on the veranda of a temple. An injured mother, looking distraught, was turning the mats over one by one in search of her child. Kiyomi Kono, age 14 at the time of the bombing, 0.9 mile from hypocenter. Corpses piled like lumber on the circular flower bed in front of the entrance to the Red Cross Hospital. Corpses of first and second year junior high students had been piled on each other like lumber. They had no sign of injury or burn. Their name tags read Second Hiroshima Junior. So these are the last two pictures on August 8th. Um, so basically, uh, just dead bodies after dead bodies um, on the street and uh, people remembering these sites. So um, I'm just gonna switch to um, myself uh, and uh, you know, actually, uh, I'm realizing that like I spent so much time like going through that picture. We're running out of time, and I prepared so many things for you. Um, but uh, you know, the point of this presentation. So I'm not gonna go over all of them today. But what I wanted to say uh, is that you can use this kind of resources, and uh, I, I'm not gonna show this uh, to you today. But there are video recordings, uh, video testimonies of Hibakusha available for free as well. Uh, and not many of them are translated into Japanese, I mean, into English, unfortunately, but uh, there are ways to present that also in your own communities. So that what's great about the drawings though, uh, so I've hosted uh, many events uh, relating to anti-nuke, and one of the debates that we have uh, always is, uh, so are the pictures too graphic, you know, for people to see? Because, um, you know, people are not used to that, not used to seeing, uh, you know, charred bodies, like dead bodies and things like that. And well, I'm kind of, kind of glad about that too, but also um, it's been like my dilemma, uh, not being able to show uh, these pictures from uh, from um, the ABOM experience. But when I found these drawings, uh, you know, I was inspired to show them because people actually were able to look at them and appreciated the stories behind these drawings. And they are very, very impactful uh, and effective. Uh, Miles like, wrote to us, what have you found the most effective? What actions can we take in our cities? So yeah, quickly, um, first, like when, when I uh, started anti-nuke and also like Okinawa, uh, US military base issues, 
uh, I started doing hosting uh, documentary films, but probably with documentary film screening is that it's very, very costly. Uh, so even though I established some uh, relationships with the filmmakers, uh, the cheapest uh, showing screening cost um, is about, you know, at least like $150 goes up to like 500. And that's really not affordable. You know, I can't, um, you know, do that. But so, you know, things like the drawings of uh, drawings by Hibakusha actually is, I think, very, very effective. Uh, and it doesn't cost you anything. Um, so, you know, uh, I hope like people are not intimidated by uh, Arlington West because that's a huge undertaking. But, uh, you know, I invite you all to host something very simple and small. You know, it can be like, a, um, I don't know, like community center uh, at your, you know, in your communities um, and, you know, um, exhibiting some like 10, 20 pictures. Um, and uh, you can do that. And, you know, um, so yeah, uh, I think what I'm trying to say is like visual presentation, uh, I think is the most effective. Um, you can, you know, read about uh, testimonies of Hibakusha as well. Actually, I posted a link to that also. Uh, you can read um, some testimonies uh, from, uh, you know, my, my school alumni and stuff like that too. But two things uh, before we close. Um, so I just want to say that, uh, so my invitation to you, uh, so my, 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 my dream, my ultimate dream is like, you know, no nukes uh, from the world, you know, we're gonna get rid of nukes uh, from the world. But like, before we get there, uh, I want this to be an everyday conversation. It, it has to be like something that we talk about every day, not only in the month of August, so that we know, uh, you know, everyone knows that uh, nuclear weapons are really not a viable options for anything okay it's like you can't use that and i so that's one uh but i quickly wanted to answer this very important question from uh uh, uh jerry condon so yeah uh I, I will say more about uh relationship between uh, nuclear power and nuclear weapons so um really like in japan uh it's being established uh like why we have so many nuclear power plants in Japan in that tiny little island uh, is because uh, uh, it was like the, uh, it was at the urging of the US government. You know, it's a known fact that after the war, uh, you know, people, I mean, they, they wanted us to have nuclear power plants because uh, so that we can be nuclear weapons ready. So uh, some sources tell us that, you know, uh, Japan, actually is nuclear weapons ready, meaning that we can build nuclear weapons in six months if we wanted to. So, uh, you know, even though like people, uh, you know, some people uh, talk as if uh, there are two separate things. Uh, as I said at the very, very beginning of the presentation, the good nuclear and bad nuclear, and you know, they actually kind of join at the hip. So, um, you know, that's, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, you know, um, I think about a year ago uh, when the US wanted to uh, sell the nuclear power plant technology to Saudi Arabia as well. Uh, the, uh, at the very same time, you know, around the very same time, uh, the possibility of Saudi Arabia uh, exploring like building nuclear weapons was also discussed. So, you know, you can really see, clearly see the link uh, between the two. Uh, first of all, um, I invite you all to like personally contact me. If you want to start something up in your communities, I'm at your service. Uh, this is my passion. This is my life work. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm available to you. If you want to plan some events, exhibition, whatnot, I will work for you personally. Uh, pro bono. So please contact me uh, and you can find my email link for futurefukushima at gmail.com in the chat. But I, I repeat again, it's all in lowercase letters for futurefukushima at gmail.com. So yeah, uh, so that's one. And uh, before we close, 
Uh, I'm sorry that we couldn't bring up uh, my friend Michiko Kato today. Uh, she actually passed away in January of this year, January 10th of this year. She was a Fukushima evacuee survivor, a fellow activist, dear friend, a mother, the most courageous person that I ever known in my life. And uh, uh, I included her in the program because if she was alive today, she would have been here with me. And uh, I had a video footage of her, but uh, couldn't play it because I ran out of time. But um, so, you know, it's actually, so all the Hibakusha from Hiroshima Nagasaki are getting old and they are, you know, uh, unfortunately dying. So we have this huge responsibility on our hands. Uh, we have to uh, carry on with their legacy. Uh, you know, we have to be a messenger that they have been with their courage and uh, uh, dedication. So um, same thing goes, you know, uh, people like Michiko-san who were very courageous about speaking up against the government, Japanese government and TEPCO and sharing her own experience. But when people like her pass on, transition to another world, uh, we have to, um, you know, take over her work and uh, uh, magnify the experiences of uh, all hibakushas in the world. Um, so I guess, yeah, uh, so that's it.